Okay, good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order this committee of the whole meeting of the Council of the Town of Saugeen Shores and welcome everyone to the Council Chambers this evening. We're glad you're here. The second item is disclosures of pecuniary interest. I'll ask any member if they have a pecuniary interest they'd like to declare. Councillor Smith. Thank you. So, so that's uh, that's 5.2 on the committee of the whole agenda, but 6.2 is on the regular council agenda, right? So you'll redeclare that at the beginning of regular council. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any further pecuniary interests? Okay. So we'll hear about that in the week start of that meeting. Okay. So there's nothing further there. We have no additions, deletions, amendments to the agenda. I don't believe we have any open forum. So. Uh, that moves on to delegations, and we have three delegations this evening. I'll just uh, remind each of our delegations that our delegations are 10 minutes in length. Uh, so we we'll hope that you can uh, adhere to that uh, time limit. If we run up against it, I'll give you a gentle reminder, but I'm sure that won't happen. So uh, with that, we'll bring in our first uh, delegation. It's Michelle Lamont from Women's House Serving Gray Bruce. Ms. Lamont. Good evening. Just wanted to test that, make sure it was working. Um, so I am with um, Women's House serving Bruce and Gray, and uh, make sure that I've got everything here. So I'm just going to run over quickly. Um, I'm the Community and Fund Development Coordinator with uh, Women's House. So I'm just going to run over quickly our uh, vision and mission statements here on the uh, up on the screen and I'm going to allow you because of time and so on I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about what is up on the screen each time I know that everybody here knows how to read so you can uh, skim through the information that that's up on the screen um, but just suffice to know that we are there to serve women and children who have experienced abuse um, domestic abuse specifically uh, and sexual abuse so or sexual assault and we serve um, all women throughout Bruce and Gray County as well as their children who are 16 years of age and under and uh, I'll go into more detail as to what our services are and that sort of thing but an interesting just a couple of myths and facts um, sexual assault is uh, a statement that is a myth is sexual assault is not a common problem and actually sexual assault is experienced by Canadian women every day and um, the violence against <clears throat> women survey found that 51 percent of Canadian women have experienced at least one incident of sexual or physical violence so Unfortunately, people often think that these statistics that we see for Canada are unique and to uh, larger communities, but unfortunately, the percentages tend to stay the same even though we live in Bruce and Gray County. Um, obviously, the numbers are different, but the percentages stay the same. Domestic abuse is a crime of the poor and uneducated is another myth. And uh, actually, oops. Um, actually, domestic abuse is an abuse is an issue of power and control, and a lack of anger management. And it's a crime with no regard for age, ethnicity, financial status, or educational background. And it crosses all socio-economic boundaries. So um, we see it in all communities. And despite and and part of this myth is that people, especially in our um, unique economic bubble we they think that we may not see it as much in our area and actually the percentages stay pretty say pretty consistent across um, Canada who's most at risk these are some of the statistics as to who's most at risk female victims most often and a surprising and scary statistic is that 11% are under the age of 11 and then women ages, ages 15 to 24 are killed at nearly three times the rate of all female victims um, 
of domestic hom homicide in general, and 60% of the women with disability, ex uh, disability experience see some sort of form of, of violence as well. These are some t statistics that I'm going to just leave you with to just kind of uh, take a look at. They're, they're uh, quite detailed, and some of them are from uh, Statistics Canada 2012. Um, one of the interesting one is that almost 67% of uh, family violence victims were women in 2012. And then, of course, the movements of Me Too in, in 2017 and Time's Up in 2018 empowered and gave a voice to women in domestic and sexual abuse situations where they came forward and started talking a little bit about it. So it... Um, it made it more, it laid more charges, made people more aware of it, um, although it was happening behind the scenes and people just weren't talking about it till that point. Um, spousal uh, violence has been, this is, these are also some more Canadian statistics, and um, Spousal violence has been consistently identified as one of the most common forms of violence against women in Canada. And women are almost four times more likely than men to be victims of spousal violence. And um, so some of the statistics, as you see, are, are really quite uh, shocking. Um, as far as domestic abuse in Ontario, one-third or 30% of uh, female spousal victims state that the incident was reported to police. So the flip side is that six over or seventy percent are not being reported. So, and women are six more times times more likely than men to say the incident was not reported out of fear of their spouse, or they're almost twice as likely to say that they didn't want anyone to find out. So, they wanted to keep it a secret, wanted to keep it kind of under the rug. These are some more statistics that I'll leave you with that are specifically. Um, statistics from South Bruce, uh, coming from South Bruce OPP, in as as stated in October of 2012, and the one that I'd like to point out to you is that 24 percent, 23 percent is what we see as far as um, victims of of domestic abuse in. Canada, throughout Canada, 24.5% is the percentage that we see in Bruce and Gray counties in this, in this sort of area. So it is very similar to what we see throughout Canada. So how does uh, Women's House help? We help with primary prevention, and that's things like education. And I go around into schools, um, service groups, various places like that, telling a little bit about what we do at Women's House. Then our secondary prevention is that we uh, have our shelter, which is, I'll go into more detail later as to what our shelter actually entails. And then our tertiary prevention is outreach programs where we actually go out into the community and have group um, counseling sessions, individual counseling sessions where we meet with the people who need that support in their community so that we don't expect them to travel to us. They don't have to be in the shelter to get supported by our counselors. So um, the services that Women's House offers is we have the community development, which I had mentioned I do, volunteer services, so people throughout the community also doing things. Um, we have our in-house shelter, which uh, is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Usually people stay, who come and utilize our services, stay for six to eight weeks. And they have counsels available, counselors available during that time. Um, we can accommodate 13 women and their children. And uh, we have 24-hour crisis lines available, usually over about 8,000 calls per year. And those are um, fielded through trained counselors during that time. We have in-house child and youth program, which includes our child witness program, which is for children who have experienced or witnessed abuse um, in their home. And those are children between the ages of 14 and 16. 
We have sexual assault services support, again, a counselor who is specifically supporting women who have experienced sexual assault. And we have transition and housing support, and that's uh, basically a counselor who helps women who have been in a situation where they need to um, get out of and they may need to further their education so that they can support themselves, find a job, find housing. They help them to transition into whatever it is that they need to support themselves um, in. And then we have our second stage housing project, which uh, Sogging Shores Council wa was uh, very generous in helping us out with for one of the projects that we had here in Port Elgin where we built four units back in November of 2009. They provided the, um, the land to us with, at, um, without any services, service costs and um, gave us the uh, property taxes for 20 years without an extra charge for that. So, um, and then we also have a unit, or three units in Wyerton and again in, in Kincardin. So those are one year for women and their children to come and stay in that, in those locations with availability and um, it's geared to income, so it's and it's it has uh, security and support of the counselors and so on during that time as well. Uh, we also have outreach counseling services and group counseling, which again are what I said throughout the community within Gray and Bruce. Our counselors go to meet people where they need to be met, and these are the areas that we offer support throughout women's for women's house throughout uh, Gray and Bruce. This year, we helped 783 women, 194 children, and we fielded 8,602 8, crisis support and advocacy calls. So we're obviously very busy. <laughs> and uh, So this is just some information about who's at risk. And again, kind of just reiterating what I had said before. Um, I'm going to skip over this part because I see my time is getting a little short, but I will just leave it for you to think about, is that a question about sexual assault that we put out to men and to women, and that's what this is about, is that we ask men what kind of uh, steps they take each day on a daily basis to keep themselves from being sexually assaulted. And when we think about it, most often men say nothing. They actually don't even think about it. Women pose the same question. It goes on for pages with things that they do on a daily basis to support themselves and to continue to keep themselves from being put in that position. So now, specifically about Women's House, we are required to fundraise this year, based on our budget, $193,592. That's just to fill the gap between government funding and what our actual expenses are to cover. Um, and to make our budget um, balance. We uh, do that through various fundraisers, International Women's Day event, a walk a mile in her shoes, a gala, they're listed there. Um, and these are some of the places where the money would go, the expenses that we would spend that, that money on. And we do that and cover those costs through donations. About a quarter of our shortfall is raised through those events that I talked about, and the remaining three quarters is covered by corporate sponsorships, municipal support, businesses, churches, and service groups, and so on. And all our donations are gratefully uh, appreciated because we couldn't do it without that support. And we couldn't continue to provide the services that we do. Um, that shortfall would mean that we would have to cut back on services and not be able to support the number of women and children that we do right now. So there's a little bit of information on our physical donations because sometimes we get um, requests for that. You can also go onto our wish list on our website if you wanted something specific to look at. But I really appreciate everybody's time tonight and you allowing me to come here and talk to you about uh, Women's House. And uh, I'm sorry, I did run over a little bit. I was trying to make it happen, but uh, oh, that's all right. uh, there's a little bit about our upcoming uh, events. If you wanted to take note of anything and participate in some of our fundraisers, we appreciate everybody coming out to them. And uh, again, thank you. Thanks, Michelle. I guess uh, we'll just ask if there's questions or comments from members of the committee. We'll start with Councillor Smith and then come to the Vice Deputy Mayor. 
way, battling over this. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Thanks so much for coming tonight. Um, this is not the first sort of sobering uh, delegation that we've had in the last couple of months, and it's, I think it's a wonderful reflection for us to, uh, to think outside of what occurs in our daily lives and understand what's happening in all of our communities. Uh, one of the most astounding statistics that I saw presented was the over 8,000 calls that you receive per year. So I just did some quick math, and that equates to almost 25 calls per day. Uh, which is, uh, you know, something that I certainly uh, take for granted that that's happening. Um, so, firstly, I would just like to commend you. I've attended your International Women's Day event on a couple of occasions, and I particularly love the Young Women of Distinction Award that you present, and I hope that uh, young women in this community who are aspiring to do great things um, and those who know them will nominate them for this wonderful award. So thank, thank you for you. all your work. Thank you. And just to actually, if I can plug, um, we, we're – asking for nominations right now. The deadline is February 14th, and uh, so you can go onto our website to get the forms if you're for young women of distinction and women of distinction. Very good. The Vice Deputy Mayor. Your mic's off. Thank you, thank you Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you for your presentation, Michelle. Thank you. And uh, it just continues to amaze me the, the great work that you do in our community, and I... I, I want to thank you for that. The uh, mission statement, I, I think, says says that all the Women's House provides a safe haven for victim survivors, knowing that ending violence is a community responsibility. And I agree with that. It is a community responsibility. It, um, you know, you do do a whole lot of fundraising every year, and one hundred ninety-five thousand dollars you have to raise again this year. And I know you made a uh, submission uh, just before our, our budget uh, discussions, didn't really name an amount of dollars that you were looking for. And I think that's one of the reasons we asked you to come back here tonight too, and I'm glad you did because it's, it's a great presentation. And uh, so um, I, don't, I don't know what other, other than municipalities are contributing towards your, your fundraising campaign, but I understand uh, Ken Carden uh, in research, I think they do $2,500. And I, I'm just hoping, Mr. Mayor, that... Um, this, this, this wonderful cause is something we should be supporting, I believe, and I know it was a request of Michelle uh, during budget uh, deliberations. So um, I'm hoping that this can be taken back to staff to, uh, to request a $2,500 donation uh, towards the fundraising campaign. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Are there further comments? So this would be a matter, yes, that we, we as uh, the Vice Deputy Mayor pointed out, this was something that uh, we received your request as part of our uh, 2020 uh, budget discussion. And uh, so we're here tonight hearing from you, but we have more discussions to come as part of our 2020 budget discussion. Mm -hmm. So by the sounds of things, this, uh, this discussion will return to the table and we'll have an opportunity to consider a, a donation to uh, Women's House. But I also just would like to echo my colleagues' comments and thanks on behalf of the community for the work that you do uh, in our community across the street here as uh, some really uh, some really vital work that you do there helping some people who are in desperate need of help and uh, that's uh, why well, we just you know uh, we uh, we couldn't run a community without people like you so uh, thank you thank very you. much to you and your group for all that you do and thanks thank for coming you tonight much. it does take a village so appreciate it thank, thank you. you okay so that moves on then to our second delegation and it is from neil Aitchison, uh to talk about the port elgin beach right revitalization uh, Mr. Aitchison. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thanks for the time. And uh, I want to acknowledge our little slideshow that I brought along has been helped with the assistance of a lifelong summer resident, Port Elgin, uh, fellow named Mitch Hughes. So I will acknowledge him and thank him. I thought while we get going here, I should maybe be on your fundraising uh, request too. It might help to... You just never know how, how much spare money you might have. Anyway, we'll go along here with our slides. And uh, that's Mitch Shoes that I referred to, who donated his time to this. And this slide here is on the left. I'm showing the proposed site plan of the outline in the RFP of February 19. And uh, the square footage of the only building on the property at the time was the train station, which was 2,500 square feet. The Demert design on the right is roughly the same square footage to be developed on that land property, but has now been moved to the adjacent, uh, to, adjacent to the promenade, and there's approximately now 30,000 square feet of building, more than 10 times that of the train station. So I'm sure we'll all agree that this is be quite a change on the waterfront. Uh, assuming from media coverage, the lease is soon to receive final approval, 
The time to create serious drawings of the site plan is now. And I'm sure the stylized picture provided by Demert at the December 16th meeting were to give us an idea of how the village might look. So now we're suggesting we start with a blank slate. And the first thing we looked at of the overall plan was just to, from the north-south orientation to Harbor Street and the water's edge to get a sense of what could be we took the whole village and gave it a quarter turn clockwise. And the next slide shows the key components to the village have now been added. On the north side is the new Whitefish Grill and event hall. It includes patios with excellent views of our beautiful Lake Huron. And on the south side is the new market space with tourism, kiosk, indoor kids zone, and the stylized honoring. awning is there for the performance space, that's the little right there. Next slide shows the market space, which can be used for year-round events, and it's attached to the kids' zones. Families would probably appreciate them being together as it brings the kids' zone into the center of the village, making it more accessible to all beachgoers. And the tourism kiosk can be situated in one end of the market space, improving its visibility to pedestrian traffic. Uh, this slide shows we have two views of the village. The first one from the southwest corner looking west, and the one on the right flipped there looking south from Elgin and Harbor Street. Just another thing to consider. The stage in Mr. Danini's original design on March in March and his presentation to council on July 22, the 2014 concept plan for the waterfront as shown on the inset also contained a stage. And if located on the west side of the village, audiences can enjoy the view of the sunset while attending a performance, somewhat larger than the McGrath Pavilion, and it can be used for many creative uses as suggested on the slide there. This slide, as viewed from the bottom of Mill Street, demonstrates the impact of the orientation of the buildings. The north-south orientation in the de Demert design blocks much of the view of the water, the beach, and the sunsets. In the lower picture, the buildings are on the waterfront, but by changing the orientation, we can now see through to the water and the beach, maintaining viewing corridors wherever possible, which was strongly recommended in the waterfront master plan. The view, improved sight lines are obviously quite self-explanatory. This slide, as seen from Harbor Street, is too a stylized drawing simply designed with computer software. With environmentally sustainable landscaping, this site could be made beautiful and eye-catching to residents and visitors alike. We took the original bird's eye view in this slide of the RFP site plan and superimpose the new design. You can see how it sits on the original footprint with the kids zone directly over the train station and the whitefish grill and event hall on the mini pot area. I hope you can see all the, the various parameters there. A 3D representation of the village once again directly over that RFP uh, footprint. And you can see there as when in a three-dimensional design where the water is, where the beach is, and the adjacent streets. And the next slide I would like to say with two designs shown side by side, you can see that the square footage of the building is pretty much identical. Both include a kid's zone, a kid's indoor play zone, but now the alternative design is centrally located. The Whitefish Grill and Event Hall are combined, which allows for one kitchen and sharing of all services. They're now located on the original footprint set back from the waterfront. A significant change is the decrease in size of the marina supply and tuck shop building since the event hall is now incorporated with the restaurant. It can be built adjacent to the Harbor Light, which is very handy for the boaters to access basic supplies, groceries, etc. Uh, with two obvious advantages to this design, the improved parking for Harbor Light customers, boaters, and those with accessibility needs. And there will be a cost-saving feature with the removal of the viewing tower because 
everyone will now be able to enjoy the sunset. Taking a look at the pros and cons. The pros of the Demert design and the amenities it provides are the exact same as those of the alternative design, just not adjacent to the promenade. In this slide, you'll see many additional pros to the alternative design. Less plowing in the winter, therefore less salt. Better protection from flooding and surging waters. Improved viewing corridors from Harbor Street. Excavation of sand will be minimized for needed in infrastructure. Open access and parking spaces for patrons and deliverables to the Harbor Light and the Whitefish Grill. Parking spaces in front of the McGrath Pavilion for Sunday night band concerts. And smooth traffic flow in and into and out of the beach area. Skaters and volleyballers can park along Harbor Street. The cons of the Deemer design I'm suggesting are north-south limit viewing corridors and easy access to the beach sand and sunsets for half the main beach area. A major concern is the blocking of the Harbor Light restaurant. We feel this is unfair. Joan Johnson has been a loyal business owner on the waterfront for over 30 years. There's no adjacent parking for the restaurant and event hall. And no one will want to trudge Scrouse volleyball courts in their best bib and tucker to get to a wedding reception or any other event. Due to the location of the buildings, more extensive excavation of the sand will be required for water, sewer, electrical, and all other infrastructure needs. Increased winterizing treatments needed for parking areas, which would be harmful to water, sand, and wildlife. Uh, limited access to the McGrath Pavilion for Sunday evening concerts also situated behind the Whitefish Grill. There are cons to the alternative design as well. The square footage of the building is over 10 times the size of the original footprint. There are still environmental concerns for sand, water, and wildlife, but we believe an environmental impact study should be taken care of. Uh, this slide shows the two pictures of the beautiful beach, first taken around 2010, and the second, of the, with the village plan using the alternative design. Of course, we agree it's time for a change. We're hopeful, though, that the alternative design proposed here, or one similar to it, is one that we could all get behind. Uh, and uh, the Port Elgin Beach Preservers are asking now for a charrette, which is a collaborative brainstorming session for all stakeholders. Copies of an explanation of how a charrette works have been provided to the clerk for those who would like one. And the emphasis on a charrette is teamwork and collaboration. We will hope you will consider it. We feel it will really help some of the social divisions that this issue has created and bring us back together as a community. The alternative design presented here tonight is not the only plan. There are many people in our community and beyond who have creative ideas for a vision of our waterfront. This is just one idea. By incorporating a charrette into the design process, there shouldn't be a big rush. We could get many ideas, shared things, and a compromise can be found. I want to thank you for your time and attention. I want to suggest that we work together, being as we've come this far, to avoid having a mistake at the lake. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Are there are there questions or comments from members of the committee? Councillor Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Aitchison. Um, I really appreciate um, your presentation and the work that Mr. Hughes put into this, and um, I think there's some interesting ideas. Um, and I'm, you know, I I would like to talk about some of these ideas. In well, good. I know there are a lot of people who would love to sit down, and <laughs> it's come this far, and never once have, have we disagreed that things need to be done. The golf course and the train station have looked like hell for a long time, to be blunt. And we know things have to be done, and we think together, working together, this council, as 
Deputy Mayor suggested. We are a community that cares, and I think the community should get in on this as well and bring people together. There's 4,400 names on, on petitions. There's all sorts of people who have phone called and emailed and made presentations, and they're asking, can't we come together and, and make it a beautiful beach? So thank you for that. Any others? Yeah, the Vice Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It was just really to thank you again, Mr. Atchison, Mr. Hughes. I, when I read the, uh, your presentation, I was, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was blown away with the amount of work that's gone into this. And I do, I do appreciate the passion, the interest you people have shown. You've, done, you've, you, I mean, you've, you've put a whole lot of work into, into this and a lot of thought into it. And I, just, I basically just want to thank you for your, uh, for your efforts. A lot of good information in here. Hey, Mike. Thanks. Thanks. Further questions or comments? Uh, Councillor Schreier. Uh, thank you, and through you, and perhaps maybe a, a question for for the CEO about Path Forward is that there there were a lot of great ideas in that presentation, and where does that go from now? And I know that um, it's public, and that the the owner is here in the room here tonight. But maybe just for clarification, is that will there be conversations had with regarding some of the items that were presented tonight as potential ideas or considerations? Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, th th there are some uh, concepts there that that were initially reviewed um, and uh, were discounted through the, the uh, evolution of the process. It's highly unusual uh, to put a parking lot between an activity space and the beach because then you got people going back and through a, a parking lot. So there's basic elements that that don't make good planning uh, sense. There are some though that that uh, could be. Uh, considered. Uh, uh, council um, will be approving the final uh, design, as you know, um, and uh, we're working closely with the proponent, continue to work closely with the component, uh, with the proponent uh, to come up with the final design. Okay, for the comments. Mr. Mayor, I might mm -hmm. add one more thing. One of the uh, partners, uh, Kevin Carter, came to our place and said, ask us, or he came down to ask and said, tell us what you don't like. Because it made it, he thought at the beginning we were against everything, and we had never been against everything. What we didn't like was the, the uh, storage locker look and running that way across the entire beach. With other suggestions, I'm sure, are still there. And uh, we believe that the Harbor Light shouldn't be cut off completely from the people who have been going there for many years, and that's a... That's a the Blue Water Tea Room and the Harbor Light has been there for as long as any of us have. And it deserves an opportunity to have access for people who like to come and have a breakfast or lunch and watch the sunset like they always have and still incorporate the plans for the new property idea. So I don't think there's a problem with a bit of a parking space on both sides because you come right down Mill Street and drive right in. I mean, uh, Elgin Street and straight in to the Harbor Light. So that's a thought on that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so that moves us then on to our third delegation. We'll just bring Councillor Smith back. So our third delegation is from Matthew Mead, the Corporate Strategic Initiative Specialist with the County of Bruce, and uh, he's here to talk to us about the Bruce County Cultural Action Plan and Archaeological Management Plan. Matt. Good morning and uh, good afternoon. Sorry, um, uh, I'm uh, I'm a little bit spoiled. I, I, t I attend uh, meetings in the morning uh, and um, not used to these evening meetings. But uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and speak uh, today on Bruce County's vision, uh, aspiration for a cultural action plan and an archaeological management plan. Um, so last uh, late last year in the fall, we um, through a competitive process, hired Timmins Martell cons uh, Heritage Consultants to help lead this effort. And um, uh, we've also created a project team of Bruce County staff that includes myself, uh, Kathy McGurr, the director of the museum, uh, Nicole Charles, the director of library uh, services, and Mark Pally, the manager of land use planning, to help support their effort as they uh, lead us through this process. Um, so the concept, the idea for a cultural action plan and archaeological management plan was really born uh, quite a few years ago, back in 2014, as part of an operational review that Bruce County undertook. And um, there were a number of recommendations that came out of that, uh, including a recommendation that the museum should play uh, a key role in uh, longer stay tourism. 
um, with a little bit of research, a little bit of consultation, and we were pretty quick to uh, recognize that, in fact, there was a, a broader, a larger opportunity uh, to incorporate heritage and culture into the larger economic development strategy, uh, specifically the, the tourism portfolio. And so in order to achieve that goal, the incorporating heritage and culture into, um, uh, into an economic development strategy, uh, at the tourism portfolio, uh, we've worked with Timmins Martel to come up with uh, four key objectives that we aspire to accomplish through this effort. Uh, so the first is to make the county uh, a leader in the identification, evaluation, and management of archaeological and cultural resources. Uh, through innovative policy, creative solutions, uh, and an approach that uh, is sustainable over time. Uh, the second is that we aspire to develop a, a, an AMP, an archaeological management plan, that addresses identified gaps in the existing planning process, uh, and that will help align uh, the practice across the county uh, with respect to requiring an archaeological uh, assessment uh, as uh, uh, required through the, the PPS, the provincial uh, policy statement. A third is uh, we uh, aim to develop a, a cultural action plan that integrates those cultural resources across all facets of the county's planning and decision-making process. And last but not least, uh, uh, the objective four is to create a, a CAP and AMP that's well informed by a robust consultation with a variety of stakeholders, indigenous communities, municipal partners, uh, and, and the general public. So in order to... Um, accomplish those four uh, high-level goals. Um, we've worked to create a six-stage work plan, uh, again, led by Timmins Martel. So the first stage is initial consultation. And so the goal at this stage is to gain an understanding of the needs uh, of the county and municipalities, uh, as well as identify overarching themes uh, that our partners uh, within the county may wish to explore through the CAP AMP process. The second, Stage is the development of a research and background paper, which uh, is exactly as it sounds. So we're looking to um, provide some historical context, the legislative framework, uh, identify gaps, uh, uh, a gap analysis, and any uh, specific deficiencies that we may be able to address. Ultimately, the idea with the, uh, with the paper is to support the CAP and the AMP uh, development and policies that will uh, ultimately support its implementation. The third is a, a robust consultation, uh, an extensive consultation that uh, will rely on feedback we hear during stage one, that initial consultation, uh, likely uh, anticipated to include a variety of um, formats, both digital as well as in person, so online, surveys, email, as well as uh, in person, so one-on-one -on -one interviews, open houses, that kind of thing. The fourth stage is a consultation report. It will describe uh, the consultations that have been held and any associated outcomes that result from those consultations. It's at this stage as well that we're uh, expecting to see a draft cultural action plan and a draft uh, archaeological management plan so we can uh, have uh, an opportunity to kind of review and provide additional feedback based on kind of uh, where we are in the process and, and what we've accomplished so far. And the last is... Um, Stage five and six is, uh, is the, the finalized uh, documents, both a cultural action plan and archaeological management plan, um, which will combine the results of the research and background paper with the outcomes of the consultation uh, to produce documents that, on the cultural action plan side, support and guide the county's cultural sector on the AMP side uh, that uh, helps effective management of archaeological resources. Uh, just a little bit further on that, so the, the final cultural action plan will include a process for identifying built heritage resources and cultural landscapes throughout Bruce County that unifies the approach taken by individual municipalities and is aligned with the provincial policy statement uh, as well as current best practices. Uh, we hope to uh, have a, a process in place through this effort that helps identify and inventory cultural stories, connects to provincial initiatives and potential funding sources, uh, and strategizes roles and responsibilities in the implementation of arts, culture, and heritage programs and protocols. The other side is the archaeological management plan and the final AMP will promote and sustain the county's goals with respect to the identification, evaluation, and management of archaeological resources, again aiming to identify specific areas of higher archaeological sensitivity as well as recommend opportunities uh, for the rich archaeological record of Bruce County. 
And so last but not least, we started this effort. Um, we were fortunate enough to have our senior management team identify this project as one that they put forward for uh, funding consideration. We received funding approval from Bruce County Council back in July, um, and we started the uh, competitive RFP process uh, in September. We're now moving towards the um, actual project activities, uh, and we're at the start, the very start, of, um, of beginning this process. Um, with uh, the hope to finish things up by the end of June and a presentation to Bruce County Council in July. That'll uh, wrap things up and, and take any questions if there are any. Sure. Thanks, Matt. Are there questions or comments from members of the committee? We'll take uh, the Vice Deputy Mayor and then Councilor Grace. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you for your presentation, Matt. Um, and I appreciate the response uh, you sent to me. I, I sent you several questions prior to the meeting, and I appreciate your responses, too. Um, it was in July 2018, Councillor Grace and I presented a uh, terms of reference to the former council um, asking for some of dollars to move forward with the writing of a, of a cultural study, a cultural master plan strategy, so to speak. And um, so the terms of reference were approved and turned down a budget in 2018. We presented again this year and, and our request again was, uh, well, this time deferred to... Um, the county in terms of not deferred to the county but deferred to this point in time to we find out what you're planning to do with a cultural study you're calling it a, a cultural action plan but I'm just wondering um, and and I think there's some thought that maybe if the county's doing a cultural action plan that perhaps the town of Saugeen Shores really would not require a cultural heritage study um, strategic plan so to speak <clears throat> a strategy and the question I have of you, um, first of all, it appears to me at first blush this is a high, high level, higher level study, uh, how it conforms with the um, provincial policy, um, county, town. Uh, these, are the, these are the things, Matt, that I see going in a local, homegrown, grassroots cultural strategy, a plan. And I just, I just want to ask you if the county will be covering off any of these items as part of your study. So if you just bear with me for a minute here, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to cl uh, clarify this. Um, will your, will your uh, cultural action plan contain any of the following? Uh, cultural, and, and you just, I'll just uh, go through them quickly. Cultural and heritage program services, pu public art policy, special uh, events policy. It relates to culture and heritage events. Um, budget impl implications for future culture and heritage program development. A survey of our arts, culture, heritage organizations. Visual art facility recommendations. Importance of heritage and culture awards program. The need for advisory committee for arts and culture. Cultural tourism strategy. Performing arts facility discussion. So that's what, those are just, and that's just a few things. Those are a few things that I see in a cultural strategy for the town of Saugeen Shores, more grassroots, more homegrown. So if you could explain to me how many, if any, of these things would be, would be covered off in a, in a cultural action plan at a higher level? Yeah, I think, um, I think there's alignment in what we would um, try to do. So the goal would be similar that, um, as I said, the, the goal for the county is to incorporate heritage and culture into um, our economic development strategy and to promote that. Uh, I think uh, our approach, and, and in the context of the county, the county is looking at, at, a, at a broad level, a, a county-wide level. So um, there are different jurisdictions. Uh, Saugeen Shores is fortunate to be uh, a little bit further ahead uh, than some. And so we're trying to create something, a, a framework, uh, a starting point for both those uh, local municipalities that may not have anything in place, as well as provide something that's of value and use to those that are further down the road. And I think um, the key component with uh, what we're proposing will be the, the consultation process. And so the, the, the value and the applicability of what we produce will really depend on uh, the feedback that we get. And, and of course, we're, we're aiming uh, and hoping and encouraging local municipal involvement. So um, we're, we've asked for a representative to sit on the advisory committee. There will be extensive opportunity for consultation. Um, and the <coughs> feedback that we receive will uh, address that, will incorporate and address that feedback that we receive. Um, I would expect that, you know, given the conversation, you know, 
tonight and, and the questions you've asked, that, that probably many of those will be identified. In terms of how far down the road they go, um, you know, that'll be a question probably for the consultant to, you know, how, how much resources can we put towards uh, local municipal needs while still serving the county's needs. Um, but I would expect they probably would be identified and um, opportunity to kind of comment on them, but I'm sure that um, there will also be opportunity to kind of customize and advance that effort further down the road to, to suit local needs. So if I may just follow up, Mr. Mayor. Um, so Matt, uh, it would appear to me that an archaeological management plan, what's the total budget for this? And it's, it's, it's all of Bruce County, correct? It is, yeah. And what's, what's, what's the total budget again? Yes, the budget's 100000 So for both. is it not fair to assume that an archaeological management plan alone, that, 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 that's a big ticket item? Certainly, it is a, uh, a large request. Um, there are other archaeological um, master plans that are quarter million dollars just on the AMP side. Um, okay. We've got 100000 to do both, um, and, and the effort will reflect that, I'm sure. But uh, in a perfect world, we hope that it has value and relevance for all municipalities, uh, how far down the road it so goes. Appreciate is, it. Is, appreciate uh, it, Matt. And I just, yeah. again, a first blush appears to me that the county plan is at a much higher level that we're we would be trying to attain at a local municipal level, but that, that's just at first blush. Yeah. Um, last question, um, I just will you, the, the county, um, be making recommendations to Saugus Shores Council at the conclusion of your findings pertaining to additional funds that may be required to ensure Saugus Shores objectives are met? In other words, when your report's completed. Would be fair to assume that you'll come back to this council and say, "Look, piggyback on onto our plan," and and the list I read to you earlier, and there's a whole lot of other things that need to be covered off with a cultural heritage strategy. It's fair to assume that you could come back here and say, "Here's our plan. We've 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 taken a look at the things that you like to do in your plan. For ten thousand or twenty thousand or thirty thousand, whatever the dollar amount is, we think we we can do more. Is that is that a fair assumption? Yeah, I think that's probably a fair assumption. Yeah. I mean, yep. so we we'll invite um, you back. Yeah, if, if, if invited, I'd be happy to come so, back and uh, so share So completion date, you're, 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 you'll be done in June, July? End of June is our target date for the project work to finish. It would go to Bruce County Council the first Thursday in July. Uh, and then after that, uh, rolling it out uh, with uh, the advisor here, uh, Jay Posner has been recommended as uh, the representative. Okay. And certainly want to include him in, in Okay, thanks, Matt. And uh, Mr. Mayor, I just appreciate the time. I, I, I'm going to continue to to preach the need for a uh, cultural strategy, heritage strategy for this community. And uh, if it aligns with the county, great. But I think uh, I just don't want this to go away, that's all. So thank you. All right, Councillor Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Matt. And I'm really pleased to see the county uh, working on this uh, from both perspectives. And I, I think it's very important. I did have a question about your report um, in terms of consultation. Um, my reading of this indicated that there was a stage of initial consultation and then a later stage um, of consultation uh, where wider stakeholder groups would be brought in. And my reading of it said that the later stage of consultation will be focused on needs identified during initial consultation. Could you clarify who's going to be consulted in the initial stage, please? Yeah, so it, it'll be a variety of groups that uh, Timmins Martel helps us identify. I think uh, also we'll rely on the representative here in Saugus Shores to provide others that we may not have uh, thought about. And so the, the needs are really around what kinds of consultation uh, the different groups would would require or would need or would would prefer. Um, and and so. <clears throat> I, th I would say uh, the initial consultation, that's kind of where we're at right now, is, is starting this process. We're at the initial consultation stage, so if, um, if folks have ideas or suggestions, certainly we would welcome them uh, and, and would suggest that they go through the, uh, the representative uh, for Saugus Shores. Okay, just a, a couple of follow-ups. So, um, so the needs that would be identified in the, in the um, initial consultation for example, would you be talking to the Southampton Residents Association, for example? That they would, you would be directly contacting that group and asking them what they see as their needs, or is yeah, that so an example? I 
Yeah, I would okay. say indigenous communities for sure. Um, uh, community groups like the SRA, mm -hmm. um, the general public as well. Okay. Um, institutions like um, uh, Pumpkin Fest, perhaps. Okay. That, that kind of thing. And that would, um, good yeah. suggestion. Just uh, in, as I was sitting here, the the Southern Shores Winterhawks. Right. Those kinds of groups. Okay. Yeah. And that would all be done first in the initial consultation, and then follow up on a broader. Yeah, basically taking the ideas and suggestions that we get during that initial consultation and then uh, following through with, with the suggestions that they've provided us. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Councilor Mayette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you. Uh, thanks, Matt, for, for coming out. Um, what I was able to glean by reading this earlier and, and what I've heard you say tonight kind of reinforced it is that there's actually a, uh, kind of like a business case behind this, that the, the investment is supposed to have a return on investment. So you're, you want to, uh, obviously because it's under the guise of the economic development and in particular tourism, mm -hmm. that you'll be, uh, you'll be hoping that these, this $100,000 that you're going to be putting into this plan will have tangible increases in, in tourism dollars and economic activity in Bruce, Bruce County, yep. right? So, uh, and I appreciate that because not always are municipal dollars spent with a a business eye to say that we're going to invest money to generate more money, but uh, that's a good thing to keep in mind. And uh, but is there uh, is there going to be a um, a follow up at some point down the road after the plan is put in place to say that uh, the money that we invested actually had a positive impact on the economic activity, tourism in particular, but others perhaps as well. Yeah, that's a good question. I would hope so. Um, we certainly. I would like to see that. Um, economic development is an interesting one. It's it's hard to measure the impacts, but uh, and I'm not an expert by any means. But yeah, I think um, certainly there's opportunity to do that, um, and would like to see that. Yeah, I think it's worthwhile, and it's probably good good to keep that lens on as you're doing the consultations, and and know that everybody gets involved because they have different people get involved for different reasons. What I'm saying, and yeah. some people do it purely because they have a, a respect for history and archaeology and all that. That's a, that's a great motive for getting in there. But if, as long as it's done with the idea that the ideas generated, if they align with your objectives, are to create increased economic activity and tourism. Mm -hmm. so I appreciate the, offer, the, yeah. the activities. Okay, further questions? Councillor Rich. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor. I'm just going to touch on something you said, or at least I thought you said. Um, at one point, you said that um, Sogging Shores was a little further ahead than other municipalities in the county. Is that is that what you said? I did, yep. Yeah. So would it be safe to assume that the real needs for the project probably lie outside of Sogging Shores? Um, I think there's probably equal opportunity for all local municipalities to, to be a part of this. I think... Um, you know, the idea is to collaborate, to work together, to kind of create this uh, county network, this county opportunity, whether you're at the very beginning or at the very end. I think there's opportunities and, and lessons that we can learn from each other, and so that's kind of the, the intent. Right, and, and, and I don't Bob, but it just seems that if we're further ahead, then, then the idea would be to try and kind of get everybody sort of on par and, and try and program throughout the county, right? Yeah, that's where you're going to have to concentrate your efforts on. Where the needs there are, the needs are different, um, there are different ways that uh, different local municipalities are ahead. So, for example, here on Kinloss has a cultural action plan already in place. They have a heritage committee, uh, and so on and so forth. So, they have uh, a variety of things um, already in place. Uh, the opposite kind of uh, on that spectrum is a, is a local municipality with no heritage committee, no cultural action plan. And uh, what we hope, what, what our intent is to provide value and, and um, applicability not only to that uh, municipality that maybe has uh, little or no uh, heritage or cultural uh, resources, uh, uh, attributes uh, known or, or inventoried locally, uh, but also to kind of learn from those other local municipalities that may be further ahead, but also uh, intend to provide value to them as well um, through uh, consultation, through collaboration, through working together. I think um, 
even if, uh, like here in Kinloss, for example, um, I think there's probably opportunity there for them to, to learn and grow and, and to uh, advance, even though they are further ahead than some others. So I would say uh, the intent is really about collaboration and moving all of us forward, whether we're at uh, you know, closer to the finish line or at the start. I think there's still opportunity there. Okay, well, thanks very much, Matt, for coming. I appreciate you putting us early in your schedule of, uh, console, of uh, introductory meetings. As you can tell, there's a fair bit of interest uh, around this table and this topic, so it's great that you came and, uh, and uh, talked about it. I was uh, uh, very pleased to support uh, this at Bruce County Council and see it come forward. I believe it's going to provide a lot of value to the town of Saugeen Shores as a, as a project uh, and uh, really uh, begin to uh, lay a sol solid foundation that we can uh, work on uh, and probably add to in the years to come. So thanks very much for uh, coming in. We appreciate you uh, taking the time. Thanks very much. So that moves us then on to, we have no public meeting, so it's report of municipal officers and committees and 7.2 general government reports and we have a staff report on the community well-being plan. That's that report. To the clerk. Thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the report before you recommends working with the County of Bruce, the County of Gray, and the lower tier municipalities to create a community and safety well-being plan. The plan is a new requirement imposed by the Police Services Act and is required to be completed by January 1st, 2021. The purpose of the plan is to identify risk factors in our community and prioritize those risk, risk factors. By focusing on the high risk, we'll create strategies to reduce the risks. The participating counties and municipalities have pooled their money together to hire a consultant to facilitate the process. The consultant has been hired and has organized over 55 different organizations, agencies, police services, and municipalities to form a community safety and well-being plan advisory committee. The expertise from the participants as well as the community input will form the basis for the plan. A public meeting will be held in Saugeen Shores between March and May of this year to gather input from our community and the final draft of the report will be presented to Council in the fall of uh, 2020. This report is recommending that Council enter into an agreement with the participating upper and lower tier municipalities and recommends appointing myself as a municipal representative on the committee. Police Chief Balai will represent the Police Services Board on the committee and as noted in the report, the cost to the Town of Saugeen Shores for this initiative is $5,000. Okay, thank you very much. I have a recommendation, then we'll take uh, discussion. It's recommended that Council pass a bylaw to authorize entering into an agreement with the County of Bruce, County of Gray, and participating lower tier municipalities to form a Community Safety Wellbeing Plan Advisory Committee and that the Clerk be appointed as the Town of Saugeen Shores' representative on the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan Advisory Committee. Questions or comments from members of the committee? Councillor Smith. Yes, firstly, I will be supporting this recommendation this evening. Um, I attended an International Women's Day event, uh, I believe it was last year, and there was a speaker by the name of Andy Schwarma who uh, came to us from the Government of Manitoba's Northern Healthy Foods Initiative, uh, which spoke sort of in general about uh, chasing systemic change and sort of the isolated impact of these types of initiatives. So I certainly, I've shared um, a TED Talk by this woman with Linda, and I would encourage folks to, to check that out as well. There's certainly tons to be gained from bringing together the resources that currently exist in isolated pockets and how we can amalgamate those services. So an individual who may be seeking service or may be at risk from a number of different factors can be brought into a holistic approach of providing safety and well-being to members of our public. So I wish you good luck and uh, thank you for representing us, Linda. Okay, further comments? Uh Councilor Mayer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I too will be supporting this recommendation. Those of us that, uh, that have the opportunity to sit on the Police Services Board will be familiar with the concept of the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan, as maybe firefighters as well. Um, and and it's, it's just such a great idea. It, it brings back together all the resources in the community that, uh, that are quite often dealing with uh, similar situations and similar uh, clients, if you like. And, uh, it grew out of the uh, the concept of a situation table, and and it's really been uh, embraced by a number of different uh, jurisdictions, and uh, it's it's an exciting opportunity. And I think Linda is an excellent choice to be on that committee. And so, let's move ahead with this one, and uh, we'll be better off for it. Thank you. Okay. Further uh, comments? 
it is a very it's a it's a significantly sized committee i think the the overall the big committee is 60 60 some odd people sit on it and then uh, there's a an executive team or whatever right, that uh, is in place to sort of guide the work as well so i think it's very important i think it's an important message uh, to send that you know uh, there's a lot of groups involved from gray bruce uh, in it and but only whatever costs come out of it will likely be borne by municipalities. I mean, we're the ones, we're the only ones at the table with cash to pay for things, uh, to do anything. So I think it's very important. We have excellent representation in Linda. It's very important that our representation there uh, be strongly, uh, um, be strong and, st and strident in making sure that, um, you know, we're look looking for cost savings or efficiencies as part of this uh, and that if there are additional costs going to come out of it that we are well informed here before that uh, becomes a reality because I think uh, um, these large projects can have a tendency to take on a life of their own and can and big things can come out of them and good things can come out of them uh, but <clears throat> it's important that our representation is uh, is strong in representing our interests and I'm glad Linda's going to be there because I know she'll do that. So you've heard the recommendation, all in favor? That's carried. So that moves us then on to uh, next staff report on the long range financial plan and the director of corporate services. Thank you and through you Mr. Mayor. I have presented to you tonight a 10 year long financial range plan. This plan was developed as a first step in many as a tool for council to get a picture of how the next 10 years could look. This plan will help to identify both risks and opportunities for the town. The assumptions used were based on the best information available at the time as staff reviewed current budget, policies, and historical trends. I will not go through these specifically as they are listed on page four of the report. This is a high level plan and one that I would consider conservative. As more information becomes available, staff will be able to refine and update the plan which will help to link budget priorities with resources available. Although there is an estimated municipal tax rate of a 3.8% mentioned in the report, I want to reiterate that this document is not intended to define or determine what our tax rate will be. Our municipal tax rate will continue to be determined through our budget process. I have five recommendations within the report. Um, the first one being to, get, to continue to gather information and update the plan at least monthly and consider going into a multi-year budgeting. Number two, to update the plan when key milestones or information is available. So update the plan more regularly than yearly if needed. Number three, as assets are built, ensure future operating costs are considered and included in the plan. And continue to advance our asset management data, which we will be working towards as we meet legislative requirements. And five, to update the reserve strategy, which will be, I will be focusing on over the next couple of weeks. Um, the recommendation is that council endorse the long range financial plan and I will turn it over if there are any questions at this time. Thank you. I'll read the recommendation then we can take questions or comments. It's recommended that council endorse the long range financial plan. Questions or comments from the committee. Councillor Mayette, we'll work our way down the table. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you for putting this report together and, and as you have stated and as it was reiterated a couple of times in different correspondence over the past day or so, uh, this is a plan and it's a, it's a crystal ball outlook of our next 10 years and, uh, and certainly there's a lot of assumptions built into it and some of those assumptions are, uh, are, are well founded. I suppose most of them are well founded and I see that the police was a, a special section there because as we know police, the policing of our community is our single largest uh, individual outlay and, and budget so so that's one that is often uh, looked at more closely and and in conjunction with with this plan uh, as you know the police are mandated to produce a business plan every third year or triannual I guess you would call it and we're in the process of doing that presently and uh, and some of the assumptions that we make and, and of course as we direct our chief to put together that plan we uh, we try and do that through a, a lens of of uh, cost constraint and we uh, we direct him and he's been he's been very good and he is very good at finding efficiencies where they are available and so um, I, I would like to think that uh, that what the plan you've put together we will take as a challenge to uh, try and stay under the assumptions that have been made particularly when it comes to policing and uh, I'm confident that we will be able to do that and uh, and I, I hope that the same applies to all the other areas of costing in our municipality that we we take this as an opportunity to uh, to you know 
look at uh, keeping costs down and keeping the cost to our taxpayers as low as reasonably possible while delivering the services to an ever-expanding uh, number of people in our, our municipality. So, so. Okay, Councilor Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thanks, Sue, for this comprehensive report, and I know it was a lot of work, uh, but it's useful. Uh, so I just had a couple of questions. Um, and uh, one of them you have alluded to already by your, your statement about the purpose of the report is not to set the tax rate. Um, but I wondered if you could um, explain what you see as the relevance of our projected inflation rate over the next four years, which I have read is... Uh, projected to be about 2.04 percent per year. Um, what's the, what would be the relationship between that and how we might calculate what you think our tax rate increase might be? So that this is where it gets very complex and <laughs> very challenging because the tax rate drives off financial needs of the town, which drives off our assessment base. So I tried to look at sort of each piece of the puzzle individually and then sort of combine them to see how it would reflect. So I, I kind of looked a little bit in isolation, but then also together to see where, what would happen and what it would look like. Um, so I, that's how I did it. So if, and as we go, and if there's anything council would like to see if scenarios, different scenarios, what if scenarios, what if we did this or that, that can easily be worked into another scenario that I could bring back with some financial implications. Would that help, Cheryl? Yeah, that does. And, I, and I'm, a, I'm asking this question because I've received some comments from constituents who've read the report. And uh, so the, the inflation rate, as you know, is calculated by the Consumer Price yep. Index, which is a market basket of, of goods. Yep commonly used goods and services uh, and that our uh, our calculation of our anticipated expenses is not necessarily that same market basket we're taking a whole yeah, bunch our of other yeah our basket of that that consumer price index would have helped me drive my projection or assumptions around salaries and benefits right whereas when we're looking at materials and supplies what we're purchasing based what the CPI is based on are, are a typically different basket of goods. So, Right. Yeah. So then if I, one more follow-up. So the salaries and benefits in the report is saying that um, we are um, anticipating maybe an increase of 4% per year for salaries and benefits. Could you elaborate on why that yes. might be the case? So... Within our salaries and benefits, we have in some of our, most of our salary grids, we have five steps. So there are different steps that people go in and in between the steps there are different. So I didn't, my calculation didn't drill down to an individual level. I did it at more of a historically what's happening, where, what, you know, age levels and new stuff. So that's sort of how I did that. And some of our benefit costs drive off of our salaries as well. So further comments. I don't see any, so uh, thanks very much. So I think this is a, uh, a worthwhile document for every m member of the public to take a look at. There's some interesting stuff in here you know, about it, just information in general about how the municipality works, tax assessment information, you know, things that, uh, you know, if you're interested in understanding a little more detail uh, with a, it, through a pretty digestible document, uh, how how your taxes work, et cetera, et cetera, this is a worthwhile document. So I'd encourage uh, the administration to uh, put it up prominently on our website and, and uh, and promote the fact that it exists because I think it's uh, this is, I think is a great document not just for council although it is useful for council but also for the for every member of the public so uh, thanks for your work and uh, you've heard the recommendation so I'll ask all in favor it's carried okay so that moves on to the third report which is a staff report on the on tourism service delivery and the director of strategic initiatives 
Thank you very much. Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, my staff report tonight uh, talks about tourism service delivery specifically. Council received a tourism strategy, our first tourism strategy in October of 2019. One of the critical areas listed was leadership and clear governance of publicly funded tourism services. This report's a first step towards transitioning tourism from the Chamber of Commerce to the municipality. The Chamber's realigned their focus and is no longer interested in delivering the tourism services it historically has. The recommendation is to complete um, our existing financial agreement and enter into an agreement for the remainder of the year, and the details can be found in the report. The 121,000, sorry, 121,500 is broken down um, to cover costs for tourism coordinator, summer student wages, marketing and promotion, visitor center in Port Elgin, and other additional costs. In 2021, I do note in the report that 100% of tourism budget will be the will be overseen by municipal staff. There's no mention of the trolley within this report, uh, within that 121,000, and the trolley is not reflected in the tourism service agreement. The trolley is a chamber asset, and the town does support the trolley through a separate funding amount through a separate cost center. So, with that, I will take any questions. Sure, we have a recommendation. Uh, it's recommended that Council pass a bylaw to authorize the Mayor and Clerk to enter into a one-year agreement, 2020, with the Chamber of Commerce for tourism service delivery at a cost of $121,500. Questions or comments from members of the committee? Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And through you to the Director. <laughs> uh, Happy to be the first to say that, I think. Maybe I missed a, an opportunity there. But um, first and foremost, um, it's no secret I've been a proponent of tourism as a, an economic driver in this community since the, the election campaign began. Uh, and I wholeheartedly support the investment in tourism staff and a budget uh, that strives to provide what was defined as uh, effective leadership. Though I'm not entirely supportive of the price tag as an interim solution, I have only one question that I need to get to a, a yes on this supporting this motion. And it is simply, can we acknowledge that uh, the $49,000 that remains between last year's budget and what would be uh, the contract with the Chamber this year, could you effectively provide the remainder of services that the Chamber is not providing with that $49,000? Could the Town of Sogging Shores, rather? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Sorry, I just want to make sure that I'm understanding. So the, the question is the remainder money to pick up the pieces of the service that the chamber will not deliver in 2020, is that correct? That's correct. So if we were okay. to uh, list the services that were provided in 2019 yep. at a cost of $171,000, now we're receiving a portion of those services for 121, correct me if I'm wrong, the remainder of those services that are no longer being provided, are you effectively able to provide those for the Delta in cost? Yeah. Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah, so I am confident that I am able to. So that does leave us with $50,000 to pick up a couple of the things that the Chamber will not be doing. The two main components specifically are the Southampton Visitor Center. So starting to have, I've done some preliminary work on what that means and how we can pick that up and service that Visitor Center. Um, also looking at the tourism strategy, which outlined a few different creative ways to offer a Visitor Center. So that is underway. There's work to do. Uh, additionally, picking up up the Canada Day festivities um, in the municipality, so working and having some preliminary conversations with community groups about the who does what, uh, keeping in mind that we do have 50,000, so we may be able to work with a vendor in the community um, to ensure that the pieces of tourism are certainly picked up and continue to be successful in 2020. Thank you. I appreciate your leadership on this, and I know you'll do a great job driving tourism in our community. Further questions or comments uh, from members of the committee? Well, thanks also uh, oh, the deputy mayor thank you mr mayor and i too would like to congrats congratulate jessica um but i'd also like to further take another step further on what councillor smith has said um i like the transitioning idea that we have going here between tourism and with the chamber i know there's there's lots of areas that are still kind of in that gray area to be covered um, the agreement is good, but I, I think I'd like to see it tightened up just a little bit to, to look after a few of those those gray areas. Uh, what happens if something is dropped? How do we look after things? Just to make sure that we have everything covered. Um, tourism, our, our chamber off, sorry, our 
tourism offices are very important to the town and, and to the way our tourism industry functions. So I'd, I'd like to just see, wonder if Jessica could take the, the agreement back and just tighten it up a little bit and bring it back to us at the next meeting. Do you have some specific suggestions, some specific areas that you're, you're concerned with? Just, um, it's kind of overall looking at uh, some ideas of non-compliance. If something doesn't happen or if it doesn't get fulfilled, we dropped a few things last year, but if, if there's a few more of those things, um, could is there ways we can deal with them? Do you have some ideas on the uh, the current language or potential changes to the language that uh, now it addresses the Deputy Mayor's concern? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I can certainly take it back and have a read through and um, find some areas that we can tighten up the language and, and perhaps be specific on these services that we have agreed that the chamber will um, will comply with, and then and um, have a look at tightening that up for you. Uh, Councillor Schreiber. Uh, thank you, and through you, and maybe just to follow up, I did have a, a, a few um, clauses in there that that maybe goes along with what the uh, deputy mayor have said. Um, one point one, it says the visitor hours would be at the discretion of the executive director of the chamber. I'm wondering if um, maybe. You should be consulted in with those business hours. We did hear over last year for sure, maybe the previous year as well, about the Southampton hours. Um, I'm not, not too sure about the Port Elgin hours um, for when it's open. Um, 3.4 in the agreement um, seeks opportunities to promote activities at its budgetary discretion or budgetary discretion. Um, so do they provide us with a detailed budget? outlining the funds assigned to the promotion and maybe this is just one of those areas that perhaps could be tightened up a little bit to get us through the next year. Uh, I think those were the two that I had anyway, but I, I agree. I think tourism coming back under your umbrella is a, is a great way. I think we just need to get through 2020 and get to 2021 and it will be fantastic, but I'd be comfortable with just a little bit of a tighter agreement as well. Okay. Councillor Smith. Thank you. And through you, uh, I agree with uh, Councillor Schreider on Section 1. Uh, in my research for tonight, I went back through the budgets provided uh, all the way back to 2016, and there were two iterations of similar concerns documented at budget time about the Southampton Visitor Centre hours. So if you, in particular, um, the art gallery has a letter on file with regard to the hours so it would be prudent to, to look at that as well and then in addition to that section 8 and Jessica you and I have spoke about this offline but uh, there's some I have some concerns about the ambiguity of the um, final sentence related to termination it does state if I'm reading it correctly and again it's it's legalese but to me it reads that although the chamber may not fulfill its obligations the town still agrees to pay the chamber all monies owing in accordance with the terms of this agreement so I think that's one in particular that I would really like to see I think the sentence needs to be um, reversed Yeah, yeah, I'd just like to comment. So thanks for that, that feedback. It's my understanding the agreement is the same agreement we've used for many years. Um, so Jessica can take the feedback that you've given and, and tighten it up. We are contractually bound to the chamber uh, up until March. So this agreement is really only for the remi remaining a few months of the year. Uh, it is a friendly agreement with the chamber um, and, and we work collaboratively, collaboratively with the chamber. So certainly uh, we can take the feedback uh, make some adjustments to it and, and bring it back to council for approval. Yeah, that would be good. I just to clarify too, there's been a couple of questions about the hours at the Southampton Visitor Center. Just for clarity, my understanding is that under this agreement, the town takes over operations of the visitor centers, uh, and I assume would determine what those hours were, et cetera, et cetera. Am I, am I off base there? Yep. No, uh, that's correct. All right. So to be clear, that would that would fall under our control. Those hours and under even in 2020 well after March of 2020 uh, but yeah I think that that's are there further questions or comments before I make a comment I just uh, I think that uh, the CAO is uh, on the right track there I mean uh, I think we've had a, you know we've had a really good relationship with the chamber over the years we've provided this service together uh, over that whole time uh, and uh, um, you know for as long as I've been here and much longer than that and uh, so I think we can come to a, a good workable arrangement here for 2020 uh, that will allow us to uh, um, get through this year. I think this is a transition that both the municipality and the Chamber of Commerce want to make, uh, and we just need uh, some. We need a, a year of runway to get that transition made uh, and uh, and move the town uh, into a position where it's where it wants to be, 
uh, controlling uh, and and looking after tourism and get the chamber into a place where it wants to be uh, uh, as well. So uh, so hopefully we can. Uh, I know we can. Uh, you know, Jess, working with our friends from the chamber, will come back to us with a with a good agreement, and uh, we'll agree to it, and uh, we'll get this uh, this tourism season uh, in uh, in good shape, the way we want it to be. So thanks very much uh, for your work, uh, Jess. We do have a recommendation. I have read it. Um, I guess I'll ask uh, all in favor of the recommendation. That's carried. So that moves us. I can do this. On to infrastructure and development and a staff report on a subdivision agreement with Red Hawk Construction Company Limited and the Director of Infrastructure and Development. Thank you. Thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor. So this is a standard subdivision agreement to allow the registration of the lots and blocks in this phase. There will be 35 single-family homes, about 50 townhouses, and one apartment block. A pre-servicing agreement was already prepared and signed by the town and the developer, so you'll see the servicing commencing soon for this phase of the development. Uh, Fairway Lane is already serviced, so this will be the next uh, piece of the puzzle. Um, once this agreement is signed, the lots will then be registered at the province, which uh, allows the developer to sell the lots and build the homes. Thank you. We have a recommendation that Council pass a bylaw to authorize the subdivision agreement with Red Hawk Construction Company Limited for Phase 3 of the West Link subdivision. Questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, all in favor? That's carried. All right, that moves us then on to community services, parks and recreations reports, and we have one report, a staff report on the Centennial Pool Agreement and the Director of Community Services. Thank you. Um, this evening I'm providing to you a five-year lease agreement for Centennial Pool. Um, it's a comprehensive agreement that the school board has um, reconfigured to amalgamate the other agreements that affected the operations at Centennial Pool. It's a standard agreement they are now using. Um, I remind uh, council that the town owns the building that's on lease lands of the pool. Uh, it's a six-month termination option included with the um, agreement, and it certainly has the opportunity to open the agreement at any time. Thank you. And I have a recommendation that Council pass a bylaw to authorize the agreement between the Town of Sogging Shores and the Blue Water District School Board to regulate the joint use of the respective services at Centennial Pool for a period of five years. Questions or comments? The Vice Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Jane. Jane, just on uh, page um, five of the agreement, article number 16.3, 16.3. Uh, to, perm to perm permit the landlord to purchase pool time between the hours of 8.30 and 4.30 at the board rate. Um, I thought we had a reciprocal agreement where they received free pool time. What is, do, do we now charge the board? Maybe we've done it for a long time. I'm probably out of date here. But what um, what is the board rate, Jane? I, I didn't think we charged them. We, do um, we don't charge them. And it, it, it's dependent if it's they need hours out in. It's dependent if they need hours within our time restra restraints. Um, We've uh, certainly taken a different an angle this year with the sevens and eights at the school now too, so it's really limited the opportunities for pool time that's available for all of them. But right now, my understanding is we don't charge them um, for the pool, and but it's a certain number of hours. Okay. 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 It just it just says they're allowed to book eight thirty to four at the board rate, but I, that's all. I just I wonder if it. If and and to be correct. fair, um, we have very limited hours that we can provide to them. I just wonder if the clause is correct, I told you. I... Okay, further uh, questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor? That's carried. Okay, so that moves on to communications, petitions for Committee of the Whole Information. There are six items there. Are there any uh, comments on any of those? Did you have one, Vice Deputy Mayor? Vice Deputy Mayor. Um, <clears throat> this is 7.7 .7 communications. Yeah. Uh, the St. John's Church letter. Um, they do have an event coming up this summer, and I'd hate to see that event. Uh, I mean, they've signed some agreements with some vendors, and uh, they're, they're banking on using the plugs here, I guess. I had a question of the Director of Community Services, uh, Jane, about the 12-month um, ice concern with St. Uh, John's Anglican Church. Uh, again, I'm, hope, I'm hoping they'd, they'd be able to use the facility this summer. The, um, 
not too long ago we asked staff to go back out, I think it was during budget deliberations, where we asked staff to go and take a look um, at potential to rent ice, you know, put ice, put ice in for 12 months of the year at the Plex, basically, and to reach out through a survey questionnaire, um, find out the number of groups that may be able to, on quote, short term, uh, rent the ice uh, at, at, at the Plex this year. And I think that report, I, I, have two, I have three questions. Number one, when is that report coming to council? And, and secondly, um, how many uh, groups did you reach out to? And thirdly, um, what was the response? Uh, you know, did you have, did you have a, a whole, whole bunch of groups say, hey, we can come as soon as this summer? Uh, have groups made their plans already for 2020, could come in 2021. Can you kind of elaborate, just, uh, just frame it in terms of what's, what's going on with summer ice and what we expect to see in your report, perhaps? Um, certainly, yes. Staff committed to bringing a report back to council prior, prior to budget being approved, and that's we are committed to that still. Um, you've asked me a number of questions that, without having the plan in front of me, I can't answer all of that. But um, we did reach out. We've conduct, um, conducted a couple of polls, and one of the polls that we reached out to communities that do currently offer 12-month ice, so we'll bring back the results from that. And we reached out to groups and organizations that offer, I'll say camps for lack of a better word, or programs um, that require summer ice. Um, I believe the number was about 13 that we had for um, contacts. And uh, they've all provided information back for us. And um, my recollection is that some of them said, yes, we're interested. We only want one or two hours a week. Um, or no, we're not. And uh, we'd be looking more for 2021, which enables us to do some more planning. Um, it was a majority of them did say they would consider, but it'd be 2021. We give them more time to do those planning. Those that said they wanted to do it for 2020 really didn't give a significant amount of hours to start um, considering 12-month operations for 2020. Okay, is there anything else uh, from the petitions for information? Councilor Schreider. Uh, thank you, and through you, the um, Lamont Sports Park minutes, um, I just want to go to 8.2. The last sentence in there, it states, uh, goal is to have all baseball operations in Saugeen and Shores be out of the Lamont Sports Park. Um, it, I believe the intent of that statement was that it was asked if all ball operations would be out of the Lamont Sports Park or would one or two diamonds remain in the municipality. Uh, it was noted that um, this would be a decision of council and staff um, once the consultant's recommendation is received. So I just wanted to clarify that last uh, statement. I believe it's, it's this committee's yeah, yeah, for them to, to say that. I think it was just a question that wasn't captured properly. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. Anything further on the uh, petitions? Don't see anything, so that moves us on to reports. See my report there for your information. And, uh, and then item nine, uh, there's two information reports from department heads. The first is the 2020 budget survey results. Uh, does the treasurer care to make any comments? The treasurer? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the report highlights the results of the public survey that was done late last fall on the topic of the town budget. Um, it was our first step of public outreach in this area, and we received 211 responses. Uh, that was a pleasant surprise to me, given the, uh, the content of the survey, or, or the subject of it, rather. Um, there were no real strong themes that, that emerged. Um, we got uh, a variety of comments and, and conflicting comments um, that touched on all areas of the municipality. Um, it, the comments, or there were almost as many respondents who felt, um, who responded positively, who, who felt they received good value for their tax dollars as there were um, who felt they did not. Uh, so I, I think that was a positive result as well. And uh, staff will likely undertake another uh, exercise in public outreach uh, for for the next budget process as well. Are there questions of the treasurer? Just, uh, thanks very much for undertaking that survey. Uh, yeah, I think that's uh, a good effort, and hopefully, uh, working with our communications department uh, over the course of this year, you'll come up with some new exciting ideas on how to how to consult on the budget. I think it's really important we consult ahead of our budgets, uh, and so uh, the more we can do to do that and and get good information uh, that we can use is, is worth doing. So thanks for that. Uh, and the uh, second item there is an information report on the police service proposal to South Bruce Peninsula. 
uh, no comments from the uh, CAO, any comments from anybody, uh, the Vice Deputy Mayor. Please bear with me here, Mr. Mayor. I have some very specific comments. If I had my wish this evening, I'd just abandon this whole idea. Um, and I may be alone around the table, and that's okay. Um, I'd like to speak to Saugan Shores Police uh, taking over policing services for South Boots Peninsula, which includes Salvo Beach, Wyerton, lots of land in between. My question in this evening is very simple. Why are we doing this? We have just opened up our brand new $6.5 million police building, a, pl a building that is supposed to provide a long-term space solution for our growing police force and accommodate our population projections. Remember, we're expected to grow to 20,000 residents by 2030. 20,000 residents. A good number of new police officers right here in Saugan Shores will be added over the next 10 years. A new building was built to accommodate that growth and we are now considering filling some of this space with South Boost Peninsula's policing staff. This past week, I look back to November 2016 when Saugan Shores Police Services Board spearheaded a customer satisfaction survey that addressed many policing questions. I think you were the chair of the board at the time, Mr. Mayor, and I think Councilor Mayette did a lot of good work on that, that particularly the business plan, as far as what I read. Over 400 residents responded to that survey. One of the questions our residents were asked, are you satisfied with policing services in Saugan Shores? The overwhelming response was yes. We are very satisfied. One thing was missing. Not a single resident made mention of expanding our local policing services to neighboring municipalities. I also read the 29 page policing business plan dated July 2017. This plan was endorsed by the police services board. Again, lots of community involvement with lots of positive recommendations, but again, no mention about expanding our services to neighboring municipalities. Mr. Kent Milroy, a well-known, highly respected Saugan Shores resident, attended the December 14, 2016 Committee of the Whole meeting and spoke passionately about our residents wanting to maintain control of our, our police and have the local influence. We were talking about the OPP back then, with the way policing is delivered in this community. I agree with Mr. Milroy. In my view, expanding our services to include other municipalities spreads the paint too thin with servicing a much larger territory. Our taxpayers spend over $4 million on community policing. $4,021,378 to be exact for 2020, which represents close to 30% of our total operations budget. Do we really want to expand our territory for the sake of saving approximately fifty dollars to $60,000? Is this what our residents in Saugan Shores want? Do our residents really want our police chief and Inspector Zettel spending up to 20% of their time dealing with South Bruce Peninsula, Peninsula policing issues? We have one of the best, if not the best, police forces in all of Ontario. My battle tonight is with the Saugan Shores Police Service. We have a wonderful police services here. What's broke? Why would we want to assume responsibility for more territory and spread the paint thinner, as I mentioned earlier? I asked the question to all of council. What is broken with our current policing system? Our residents have repeatedly indicated they're perfectly happy with our local police force. Yes, this council instructed our police chief to provide a costing report for South Bruce. I remember that motion, and I supported going out and getting pricing. I admit that. But this does not mean we have to proceed any further. Is $50,000 in savings and a $4 million budget really worth spreading the paint thinner by assuming the responsibility of a much larger territory? My understanding is that our police officers report to duty here in Saugan Shores and travel 35, 35 to 40 minutes to Wyatt and to carry out their duties and then back to Saugan Shores Police Headquarters at the end of the day to complete their paperwork. And I guess I say, really? Uh, that's what I was told. Is this the best use of police resources by spending one and a half hours per day getting to and from the work site? And what happens to North Bruce Peninsula policing services with South Bruce Peninsula coming our way? Are we going to consider North Bruce Peninsula as well? I have listened to arguments about cross-training, making more resources available in the event of emergencies. It's important to know that in the event of a significant emergency, event or emergency, Saugan Shores can reach out to the OPP for air support, K-9, emergency response and tactics and rescue teams. I verified that with the OPP. 
we have tax we as PAC taxpayers pay for those services we don't have to rely on an expanded police services partnership with South Boots Peninsula to ensure a higher quality service when we already have a high quality local police force and our OPP on standby if needed mr. mayor our residents bought into a brand new 6.5 million dollar police building and our residents will be paying for this building for the next 20 years I find it mystifying that we may have to expand our brand new police building within the next 10 to 15 years so some people may argue that point but we're adding a firm number of officers to our brand new police building not only from South Boost Peninsula but I just heard from our local police Mike Bailey who's doing a wonderful job that we're adding one officer per year for the next five years that takes space that takes lockers Our population will go to over 20,000 residents over the next 10, 15 years, perhaps higher than that, than that number, and we're going to require more police officers for sogging shores. We're going, to need, we're going to need our building for our own use. And what about Aaron Eldersley for that matter? I only wonder, if we go with South Boots Peninsula, is Aaron Eldersley next? And then what happens to our brand new $6.5 million police building? This is wrong. The whole thing is wrong in my view. Mentioned Aaron Eldersley, what about North Boots Peninsula up in Lion's Head and Toe Murray? The South Boots Peninsula leaves the OPP. Mentioned Aaron Eldersley, the next municipality requests the service of the police chief, and that hasn't happened, I grant it. But this community too could request the services of our police chief, Inspector Zettel's time, space in our brand new police building why would we want this to be soggy insurance taxpayers responsibility I don't get it this is not what our taxpayers agreed to, our, to when we spent 6.5 million dollars on a new state-of-the-art police services building that was built to accommodate our own needs based on our population growth projections we built that building for the next 20 years 30 years 40 years mr. mayor if this is my sole decision alone to make tonight, I would end this discussion tonight. It's not my sole decision. I know this tonight, this report is not about making the final decision, but we're going down that path. These are my final thoughts regarding this important decision. And I know we're just in the beginning stages, as I mentioned. This is a, this is a very important decision we're making for 20 years for that brand new building we just built. I don't want to share up to 20% of our police chief's time tending to South Boost Peninsula policing issues. I don't want that. I don't, and nor do I want to share up to 20% of our inspector's position with another municipality. Nor do I want to entertain any thought that we may have to expand our brand new police building over the next 10 to 15 years due to taking on South Boost Peninsula policing and taking into consideration our population projections that we'll see us grow to over 20,000 people. This community built a brand new building based on the fact that we were too small of a building. We built a building that we thought was going to be good for the next 20, 30, 40 years. I don't get this. I don't get it. The system's not broke. It's our residents who pay a substantial amount of money for our own community police force. And it's our residents who are paying dearly for our brand new police building. Our residents, in my view, do not deserve this, Mr. Mayor. I am adamantly, and I might not get much support around the table, and that's okay. I am adamantly opposed to this move, and I'll be voting against any motion that comes forth in the future. And I think we really do need to rethink this. So you know, I'm probably going to hear it. Those are my thoughts, and I feel strongly about it. Be careful. I think we need to be careful. This is a 20-year agreement. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and it's important to be clear that this is not a, there's no vote of council on this uh, matter this evening. This is uh, just an information report. Uh, the municipality uh, has already uh, decided to uh, forward this uh, um, uh, proposal to South Bruce uh, Peninsula, and uh, their council will uh, look at it and, um, and or not and decide uh, whether they're interested in it or not, uh, at which point uh, our council as well would have to have a public discussion 
about whether we are interested in it or not and decide whether we would willingly uh, sign such an agreement uh, or not. But um, I think it's important uh, to remember that, um, you know, not only do we need to look at uh, today and where we are now, but we need to look at the future. And the Vice Deputy Mayor has talked about those growth projections. Uh, and they're there and they're real. And we have to build services that will serve our population as it grows. And not just police, but uh, EMS, fire, uh, and any number of other services. And the municipal taxpayer in the town of Saugeen Shores is going to be under a lot of pressure uh, to build out those services uh, with the new people who move here and make sure that all those services that we rely on and need are in place. Um, economies of scale will help us to do that. Uh, economies of scale will uh, help us to defray those uh, increases to manpower that uh, have been projected. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, if you can build out the service, uh, I think uh, you can use the administrative potential that you have in place to manage more people uh, and, uh, and, again, build that economies of scale. Uh, so I think a larger service could certainly serve uh, the town of Saugeen Shores better. Uh, and uh, as well as uh, another municipality or or uh, potentially more but I think that the uh, you know we were approached by uh, the municipality of South Bruce Peninsula uh, and um, we uh, this council uh, voted to entertain uh, what they were requesting and uh, um, we received back report from the chief of police and uh, and have made a, um, have sent uh, forward uh, this proposal that's here tonight uh, to South Bruce, and uh, the discussion is beginning uh, today and not ending. Uh, so uh, we will see where that discussion goes. But uh, we thank the Vice Deputy Mayor very much for his comments. So, if there's nothing further, uh, then uh, we'll move on to announcements by members. Deputy Mayor, Vice Deputy Mayor, uh, Councillor Schreider. Um, thank you. I attended last Thursday night the first trivia night. Did I steal yours? I'm sorry, Councillor Smith. Um, uh, at, uh, hosted at Lakeshore Recreation. It's a fundraiser for the Saugeen District Senior School uh, for some outdoor equipment, playground equipment, I think for some of the sevens and eight, grade sevens and eights. Um, my team did not win the trivia night, but it was a lot of fun. I encourage everybody to... Uh, to contact Karen Fair at Lakeshore Recreation uh, and participate. I think she's going to try and do it on a weekly basis. So it's a great little fundraiser and a good night out. Thank you. Councillor Smith. I would echo Councillor Schreider's comments. And I will say there were three councillors at the table. None of our teams won. So uh, we'll try harder next time. Thanks. Councillor Rich. Nothing. Councillor Grace. Nothing. Councillor Carr. Councillor Carr. Yes, thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. Once again, uh, over the Christmas holidays there, I just want to recognize EB's Barbershop downtown again. They actually recognized their 125 years in service in this community. I know, I think it was back in August that uh, Mayor presented a certificate for them, but I don't think we can recognize a small business like that enough for serving our community for 125 years. Small business, large business, it doesn't matter who you are. That's, that's a huge accomplishment that I think should be recognized by everybody. Thank you. Very good. Councillor Mayette. Yes, briefly. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, two things. One is uh, along the, the same lines of the police uh, conversation that has been going in and out of our agenda tonight. Uh, the police uh, service is currently, in the, under the guidance of the chief, currently conducting the business plan review for the next three years. So there are opportunities for members of the public to uh, log on to the Survey Monkey tool that is being used to, uh, to gauge public interest and feedback and satisfaction with the police force. So I encourage everybody listening to uh, go on to the any one of a number of platforms but uh, certainly the police service uh, website will get you to the survey and uh, secondly I'd just like to acknowledge the passing of a, a very significant member of our community in Murray Tatey who, uh, who recently passed in fact there's a visitation going on as we speak I believe and the funeral is tomorrow Harry was uh, not only a uh, valued member of the community he was a neighbor of mine and uh, and along with him and, and some of his family were, were close to our family and, and uh, welcomed us to the community when we came here 23 years ago. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and I just wanted to uh, uh, thank the uh, Port Elgin Legion for their uh, New Year's le levy on uh, New Year's Day. I had the privilege of attending it and it was uh, well organized as always and uh, very much appreciated the invitation to be there. So 
Uh, that brings us to the end of the agenda. A motion to adjourn. The Deputy Mayor, Councillor Rich, all in favor, will stand adjourned till uh, oh, 825.